Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This, tonight's uh, program is co-sponsored by the Program on Constitutional Government in the Government Department and by the Institute of Politics at the Kennedy School. Our subject tonight is virtue and conservatism. Last October, Andrew Sullivan wrote an article in the New York Times Magazine against conservatives who've been scolding Americans and American government for lacking virtue. These virtue skulls, he actually named some, were people like William Bennett, and Father Richard Newhouse, Robert Bork, and some others. But it was said, either by Andrew Sullivan or by the person writing the lead or the heads, the moral crusades virtue uh, urbane commander in chief is William Crystal. <laughs> if uh, urbanity and a moral crusade go together, I think they might do so in William Crystal. Both of these uh, uh, gentlemen are, are friends of mine and actually former students. They're going to consider the questions, when conservative because conservatism becomes moral, does it become too authoritarian? Or when conservatism becomes liberating, does it become too lax? But they'll do it better than that, with detail <clears throat> and interest. We're beginning, beginning with Andrew Sullivan. He was an undergraduate at Oxford. And then he went to Harvard, got a, a, the aforementioned PhD in the Harvard Government Department. He's been the editor of the New Republic, and he's the author of two books, Virtually Normal and Love Undetectable. William Crystal went to Harvard, and then he went to Harvard after that. <laughs> also with his PhD from, uh, from the Harvard Government Department. He was a professor for a while at the University of Pennsylvania, and right here in this very building, the uh, John F. Kennedy School, I think it's called. After that, he went into, after being a professor for a while, he, he went into politics for a while. And he, was, um, he worked at the Department of Education in the Reagan administration, and he was chief of staff for Vice President Dan Quayle in the Bush administration. And then he became founder and editor of the Weekly Standard. We're going to begin with a statement by Andrew Sullivan, who's wearing this beautiful crimson tie with H's on it, which he just bought over at the coop. <laughs> I swore that if Harvey uh, pointed out that I had just bought this tie in desperation at the coop, I was going to point out that my fondest memory of Harvey was being his teaching fellow in one of his notoriously tough courses, and showing up one day with my first grading report, which he scanned rather brusquely and looked up and said, uh, Andrew, how many of these uh, B minuses can we turn into C pluses? <laughs> You've already started out with a lie. <laughs> <clears throat> delightful to be back at Harvard and in this place, of which I am actually an alum, Kennedy School, to talk about a subject which um, I care deeply about. Conservatism, what it is, what its meaning is, what the political tradition of conservatism really amounts to, and whether it has been betrayed, even distorted in recent times. I don't come here to bury conservatism, I come to praise it. I was born in the 60s, grew up in the 70s. I guess everybody has a sort of moment of political awakening. Mine was in an England in which the marginal top income tax rate was 98%, in which taxes rose, the government controlled more and more of people's lives, in which it regulated the smallest act by free human beings, and in which the leadership of the West cravenly looked at the Eastern European economies and societies as the wave of the future. And in terms of opposition to the Soviet Union, responded with weakness and vacillation. As a teenager, I saw that and instinctively felt that it was wrong. It's quite trendy now to be such a conservative. It wasn't back in the 70s. I was uh, a teenager in high school wearing a Reagan 80 button. If you think it's dweebish, 
to be in an American high school with a Reagan 80 button. You should have been in a British high school. I might as well have shown up in a white sheet. I don't have much time. I want to talk about three essential, essential and central features of what has happened to the conservative movement and the conservative political tradition in the last few years. About how what I believe, a party and a tradition which was about restraining government, about the limits of government power, about the possibilities of human freedom and initiative, has been subverted ever so subtly, but very fatally into the opposite. I'll begin with the most obvious case in which this seems to me to be true. This extraordinary venture of the last year and a half in which the conservative movement attempted by any means necessary to remove a president whom they regarded as the apotheosis of their cultural disdain. I'm talking about the attempt to impeach and remove a president of the United States. And when you look at that effort, and you look at the building blocks that it took to construct that effort, you see exactly how rotten the conservative movement has become in terms of its own conservative principles. Look at the building blocks. A presidency, the institution of the executive, made vulnerable for the first time by an extraordinary ruling that a president could be vulnerable and sued while in office in a civil suit, even when he has to govern this country and be the leader of the free world. It used to be that conservatives defended the executive against this kind of legal morass. But oh no, conservatism now is in favor of weakening the presidency by legions of civil lawsuits, even when such a civil lawsuit is dismissed almost as soon as it is brought, it is so weak. The second building block, sexual harassment law. Who would have thought that conservatives, who were always very leery of law that would empower the government to question human beings about the most intimate details of their sexual lives, would throw their full weight behind a sexual harassment law that didn't merely prosecute sexual harassment, but empowered prosecutors and lawyers to ask about a person's sexual history, regardless of whether that sexual history had anything to do with sexual harassment at all. The movement that used to be about privacy and the restraints of government, unleashing itself with the weapons of radicalism to destroy a president. And thirdly, an independent council law. An independent council unconstitutional, unleashed by radicals and by liberals to disturb the constitutional balance, embraced by conservatives because the means, uh, the ends always justified the means. Who was the greatest critic of the Independent Council? Why, Antonin Scalia, one of the leading conservative political and judicial thinkers. But all that went by the board. Because the zeal to destroy a president of the opposing party led conservatives to abandon and betray every single principle they ever held. And why? What was it about? What was it really about? They will say it was about the law, breaking of the law. As if anybody believes that perjury, even obstruction of justice, which wasn't proved, in a civil suit about sexual harassment is equivalent to treason and a crime against the state, as clearly the founders intended impeachment to be, as if those two things were equivalent in any sense of the word. It's not even close whether this was impeachment material. But Mr. Crystal and the conservative movement led the crusade to do this. And why? The answer is in one word, sex. What's at stake in the Lewinsky scandal, the Weekly Standard thundered last year, is not the right to privacy, 
But the central dogma of the baby boom is the belief that sex, so long as it's consensual, ought never to be subject to moral scrutiny at all. Do you think that if this was about a financial deal, they would have pursued it with such zeal? Do you think they would have gone over the cliff politically if it wasn't about tiring and besmirching someone because of the desire and the need to construct a new sexual morality in this country? Yes, David Frum was right. Yes, the Weekly Standard was honest. They didn't want an adulterer in the White House, and that was the ultimate input and impetus behind their crusade. The second recent element in this grand abandonment of conservative principle lies in another single word, which is related, abortion. It is hard to understate how once conservatism was about allowing people with radically different views, with radically different consciences, to be able to live in a constitutional regime, to respect one another's privacy, to respect one another's differences, but to uphold the law and to govern with moderation and restraint. That is no longer at the heart of American conservatism. Here is what is at the heart of American conservatism. Republicans, I quote, talk a lot about being a majority party, about becoming a governing party, about shaping a conservative future. Roe versus Wade and abortion are the test. For if Republicans are incapable of grappling with this moral and political challenge, if they cannot earn a mandate to overturn Roe and move toward a post-abortion America, then in truth there will be no conservative future. Abortion not simply is an issue, not simply as something of which some people, including myself, might want to make a moral statement about what they believe abortion to be, but as the central issue of conservative politics in this country. The one issue on which there can be no compromise. The truth is, another quote, that abortion today is the bloody crossroads of American politics. It is where judicial liberation from the Constitution, sexual liberation from traditional mores, and women's liberation from natural distinctions come together. It is the focal point for liberalism's simultaneous assault on self-government, morals, and nature. So challenging the judicially imposed regime of abortion on demand is key to a conservative reformation in politics, in morals, and in beliefs. Both those quotes are from William Crystal. What conservatism used to be about, a defense of people's own consciences against the state, a defense of people's privacy, a defense of the rule of law in a liberal society, has become a reformation in politics, and then not just in politics, in morals and in beliefs. It has become a religious movement to change people's beliefs about some of the most fundamental things imaginable. And this is not merely about changing the law on abortion. It's not merely about getting rid of Roe versus Wade and allow people to actually decide for themselves legislatively, which, frankly, I'm not totally opposed to. And I think if it were a matter of legislative decision and of popular will, it would still be legal in almost every state of this country. It's about a constitutional amendment to the Constitution of the United States to make abortion illegal in all cases, including rape and incest. That is the position supported by Mr. Crystal and the Republican Party. That is the extent to which this is an assault upon the Constitution of the United States. And the third issue I'm going to bring up is an issue close to my heart. It's the issue of homosexuality. I mention this not because it is a huge and central issue in our national politics, but because often it is the minor issues, dealing with small minorities, that tell you something very interesting and significant about a political movement. And what has happened is that conservatism as a 
intellectual movement and indeed as a political movement has gone from toleration of people to an entire new level of attempts to cure, to impose, and to therapize fellow citizens. This is what Richard John Newhouse, a close ally of Mr. Crystal, said at a conference which Mr. Crystal also spoke to. Homosexuality, he wrote, is a way of life that's marked by compulsion, loneliness, depression, and disease, comprising a history-limiting horizon of a sterile worldview, divorced from the promise and peril of successor generations. Homosexual life, Mr. Newhouse argued, was a, quote, culture of death, unquote. Can you imagine any other group of citizens in this country being generalized about as a culture of death? Can you imagine any self-respecting intellectual sharing the same platform as that? We have gone from a situation where people might have legitimate disagreements about the role of homosexuality in public life to a political movement that is describing homosexuality as a, quote, disease, unquote. The very words in the brochure of the conference that Mr. Crystal attended and whose papers Mr. Crystal has written introduction to and has recently been published. It is very hard to talk about a civil tradition of conservatism when it is labeling two to three percent of the population as diseased. That is not a civil conversation. It is not a conservative conversation. It is a deeply disturbing change of rhetoric. Again, the politics of this, like with abortion, is not merely benign. It also includes not simply opposition to all civil rights for homosexuals, including the right to serve one's country and the right to marry, but also the imposition of sodomy laws which will allow the government to go into people's homes and arrest them for private consensual behavior, a position endorsed by Mr. Crystal's own magazine. How did this happen? What happened to a tradition that believes in moderation, in constitutional government, in mutual respect? I don't know. I don't know what happened to the notion of mutual tolerance and respect in a civil society which is inevitably divided by profound issues of conscience. I believe in conservatism as a bulwark against a religious war, not as the main impetus to launch a religious war. I believe in a conservatism that believes that government can act neutrally and equally towards all its citizens with restraint and moderation and doesn't target particular citizens for extraordinary demonization and stigmatization. I believe in a conservatism that can embrace all Americans and attack the real problems of overweening government instead of a conservatism that has become complacent about the size of government and compensates by any manner of fundamentalist screeds and crusades. I'm nearly dumb, but I want to say this, that Many of you here are of a different generation. You may have grown up seeing a conservatism that is markedly different from one that was around only 15 years ago. Whether you are liberal or conservative, you all have a stake in the future of this political tradition, in rescuing it from the fundamentalists, in rescuing it from the fellow travelers of the fundamentalists, in restoring the calm skepticism of conservative constitutionalism and facing down what Reinhold Niebuhr called the frantic orthodoxy which has replaced it. Thank you. Where to begin? Um, this is a little different from responding to Sam Donaldson. Uh, 
or even, or even to the more challenging, all too human George Stephanopoulos. Um, leaving aside various exaggerations and uh, caricatures and straw men, I guess I will plead guilty to the basic charge, as I understand it, that um, I believe that a part of conservatism is a, moral, a kind of moralism, if you want to call it that, or the conservatism, to put it otherwise, is not simply about restricting government. It is also about encouraging citizens to live decent lives and in some ways admirable lives. The conservatism is about virtue as well as, as, it, as about liberty. And I think American conservatism always has been about those two things. If you go look at National Review, which was before both of our Andrew, Andrews and my times, uh, there were huge debates about the right balance between virtue and liberty in the 60s and Russell Kirk and Frank Meyer and others uh, engaged in these debates. But the notion that conservatism is simply about limiting government, I don't think has ever been true about American conservatism, British conservatism, uh, or the conservative tradition. Um, if one wants to defend a libertarian view, that's fine, but one shouldn't pretend that that's what conservatism has been in general in this country, either as an intellectual movement or as a political movement, or as a political movement. Um, no, I plead guilty. Morality, our public morality is important to our political well-being. I plead guilty to the charge that I believe that amoralism is more of a threat to this country than moralism. I plead guilty to the charge that I believe Bill Clinton should have been impeached and in fact should have been removed from office, not because he was an adulterer in the White House, but because he lied and obstructed justice. Uh, David Fromman writing in February before any impeachment proceedings had be, been begun or really conceived said that the Lewinsky affair, I believe he meant, I have, have the article here, culturally and sociologically speaking, uh, is about this proposition, which I think it was. Uh, whether the sort of consent is the only standard for, uh, by which one is permitted to judge uh, a, a judge of acts between consenting adults. Um, but that is not the legal grounds uh, for, for removing Clinton, and no one argued that they were. Certainly, we never argued that they were. Yes, I would prefer, however, not to have an adulterer in the White House, and I think it would be better for the country if adultery were discouraged and if presidents who committed adultery were shamed for doing so. But I don't think that, that is grounds for impeachment. Um, no, but I believe that Clinton and Bill Clinton and Mo the, the moral or amoral world of Bill Clinton and Monica Lewinsky is more of a threat to the future of this country than the alleged uh, excessive moralism of Henry Hyde and Kenneth Starr. So I believe all of those things, and I may be in a minority in this room, and I may be in a minority of the American people in believing that. And if Andrew wants to say that that's somehow not conservative, fine. So then let then I won't be a conservative. I still think it's, uh, I think it's true. Um, similarly, I believe that Roe v. Wade was wrongly decided and that its wrong decision is particularly, uh, as a bad decision of the Supreme Court, is particularly important, not just because of its practical effects uh, in terms of uh, legalizing abortion on demand across the land, but because it is particularly bad constitutional law. Um, it is, as I think John Hart Eli said at the time, a uh, Harvard Law School professor who, so far as I know, is personally not pro-life, or uh, at least I don't know that he is. I don't think he's ever been active in that cause. Um, said at the time, it's not simply bad constitutional law. It's not constitutional law. Um, I, that's why I think overturning Roe is so important and why I think it is central to a conservative future, partly because I do not think a nation with 1.3 million abortions a year is entirely a healthy nation. I would like that, that number to be radically reduced. I am totally realistic about the incremental steps that will have to be taken in reducing it. If Roe v. Wade were overturned, if the next president were to appoint two justices uh, so that there were five votes to overturn it, it would go back to the states. Most states would be mostly pro-choice. I think the number of abortions would decrease, and I think one could then make the case in the public arena uh, against abortion, which I would be happy to do, and many others would do, and many others would defend the abortion right, and it would come out differently in different states. Uh, in the article that Andrew quoted, where I uh, explained that I thought abortion was the bloody crossroads of American politics, and said that I thought challenging the judicially imposed regime of abortion on demand is key to a conservative reformation uh, in politics and morals and in beliefs, I went on to say, if this reformation is to have any chance of success, it will have to proceed more in the spirit of Lincoln than of William Lloyd Garrison. It will have to persuade, as well as to Hector. It will have to be serious about intermediate means, as well as ultimate ends. And it will have to demonstrate sober understanding, as well as burning concern. 
Before, at the end of the day, a conservative future requires a conservative political majority. Such a majority does not yet exist. It doesn't, and that's the conservative task. There's, an, I think, an anti-liberal majority in the country. That's what 1994 showed. Uh, there's a, perhaps a potential, there's an ambivalent majority in the country. That's perhaps what 1996, which returned to Democratic presidents and a Republican Congress in 1998, in which the popular vote was almost uh, e slight Republican advantage, but was evenly split in, in the national vote for, for the House and, and for the Senate. Uh, slight Republican advantage in the Senate, slightly greater advantage for the governorships. Um, when have, we have an ambivalent majority right now. There is as yet no governing conservative majority in this country. And I said con creating such a majority is the task uh, before us. So I, I don't pretend that that majority exists, but I don't see why it shouldn't be a perfectly legitimate task for conservatives to persuade others uh, uh, of the correctness of our beliefs uh, and to seek to reform society. I mean, that's what a reformation is. And not just politics, but also manners and morals and beliefs. Obviously, some of those things have to be changed simply through persuasion. Others have to be changed through a combination of law and persuasion. But I understand perfectly well it's a constitutional democracy, and I'm happy to work through constitutional forms to try to affect this, these, these changes. I do think uh, Andrew is being disingenuous and pretending that conservatives have never cared somehow about beliefs and, and morals and that we're supposed to limit ourselves to this very narrow political task of curbing the size of, of government. At least that's not the conservatism that attracted me as a young man. It's not the conservatism that Bill Buckley law, Bill Buckley's first book was called, I believe, God and Man at Yale. It's not the conservatism of Whitaker Chambers or of Ronald Reagan, Barry Goldwater, whose book was called Conscience of a Conservative. And if you read it, it's not simply by any means a libertarian book, uh, though he changed his mind a little bit uh, later in life. Um, I think this is the tradition of American conservatism. It may not be right in every respect. There are parts of the American conservative tradition I don't agree with. And I think liberals have been right about a fair number of things, and especially in the 50s and 60s. And uh, I have, that's fine too. People shouldn't choose their positions based on what tradition they come from, but whether they think they're, they're correct. Um, this, the, uh, Andrew's article in the New York Times Magazine that Harvey referred to and that he, Andrew, to some degree, uh, has sort of updated the arguments from tonight is, is an, uh, a very interesting and well-argued well polemic. It's a little, it was odd for me reading it. I mean, I enjoyed reading it. It's nice to see oneself quoted so much in such a prominent place <laughs> by such an eloquent writer and given such uh, uh, unmerited, in truth, uh, power, alleged power over my fellow citizens. I wish I were as, as, as powerful as Andrew uh, seemed to make me. Um, but it was also interesting, you know, being scolded by Andrew for being a scold. Um, and what strikes me the most, uh, I don't know whether to be the, uh, it's hard being at once a scolder and a scoldee. Um, but what strikes me the most, and I think what puts the lie in a sense to Andrew's argument for, gee, can't we just take all this moralism and moral indignation out of politics, is of course his own moral indignation, which I respect, which I respect. Andrew makes moral arguments for same-sex marriage. He makes moral arguments against the current policy on gays in the military, and he makes them with some moral fervor, and he's entirely entitled to. And I respect him for, taking, for making the case seriously, but the notion that somehow the right wing is dominated by all these fervent moralists, and then there are these prudent, calm, laid-back, uh, old-fashioned conservatives who just are taking things one step at a time and trying to get uh, uh, bold and radical appeals to justice out of politics uh, simply, isn't, simply isn't true. Um, in fact, I mean, if, if, if there, there would be a, an attitude that could be taken uh, for on, on the issue of gay rights, for example, uh, the, that would say, don't push this issue. Gay rights has made a huge amount of progress over the last 20 or 30 years. Why provoke America by insisting on the right to marriage when that's the one place where Americans seem, a majority of Americans seem to want to draw the line? That, in fact, would be I believe, the Oakshadian argument uh, in, this, in this area. Andrew doesn't make that argument. And I'm inclined to respect him for not making it because it's, I prefer actually to see, though there are prudent reasons perhaps why you don't want everyone making moral arguments all the time in politics, this is an important issue and it should be confronted on a serious moral ground and not simply on grounds of prudence or what the traffic will bear in society. But again, uh, he appeals to justice in making his arguments and it's, it's rather hard to then tell sort of the other uh, side of the argument that they can't 
appeal to justice, and, and they can't make arguments based on, uh, on, on, on first principles uh, on their own right, in their own right. Um, it's an odd time in America, at the very end of the 20th century, when politicians are fearful of, appeal, of appealing to morality. You know, to be called a moralist is the sort of one charge that they all shrink from. They prefer, anyone who prefaces any statement, especially a conservative, on any serious issue has to preface it with several sentences about how he's not trying to impose his views on anyone else, and he doesn't want to sound like a preacher, and he doesn't want to tell other people how to live, but he humbly believes that perhaps, you know, we shouldn't have 1.3 million abortions a year. Um, it is an odd culture, I think, where, it is, it is where, where morality doesn't have confidence to speak for itself, uh, but I think that's not a healthy situation. Again, I think the problem with America today is not that there's too much moralism, uh, but that there is uh, too little morality uh, in public life, that moral considerations are scorned rather than uh, um, elevated. Um, and that's not to say that you can simply invoke the word morality or, 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 or that one has to obviously explain the moral case. Uh, one has to explain why morality matters uh, and what, mo what morality requires. But I think that is the conservative uh, task now, the remoralization of society, if you want to call it that. And that means, on the whole, uh, a lot of that is pursued through non-political means, but obviously one can't simply leave aside politics. Uh, there, as Andrew himself would argue, I think, there are all kinds of laws and political decisions that have moral implications and moral uh, uh, presumptions embodied in them, and, and one can't ignore uh, the, the moral side of those questions. So conservatism, I, I would say, is about virtue as it is about liberty. Liberty, perhaps, is the first principle of our republic, equal rights, uh, but virtue is also a principle uh, necessary to the well-being of the republic. Um, and the truth is, for all of you know, Andrew's sort of flattery of me as being such a powerful political figure, the vast majority of Republicans and conservatives are with him on this. They're terrified of the religious right. They spend all their time explaining how they're not in bed with moralists like me. They ran away from the Clinton impeachment as fast as they could. It's a pure fluke that Clinton, that Gingrich got deposed as a result of the election losses. Livingston wasn't in charge yet. Hyde just went about doing his business and the Judiciary Committee impeached Clinton and everyone got so furious at Clinton for continuing to stonewall that they actually managed to get him impeached through the House. The Senate got rid of it as fast as it could and Republicans are now desperate to put it beyond us. Um, there's no great, I wish there were more appetite for engaging in moral argument on the right. There isn't much, uh, and I'll, I'll do my best to uh, increase that appetite, but I, I don't expect to have a huge amount of success. If you look at the presidential candidates, they're not exactly where I am on overturning Roe v. Wade. All the mainstream candidates are busy basically reassuring uh, pro-choice voters that even though they're personally pro-life, they're not going to do anything too serious to advance the pro-life agenda. Um, so I, I'm afraid in the short term, and I think the reaction to Clinton shows this, uh, Andrew may well be winning in this intra-conservative fight, um, but I, don't, I do think in the long term uh, that the moral component of conservatism is important, uh, not just to conservatism, uh, but to the country. Did you want to make a point uh, right now? Yes. <laughs> of course, I'm not saying that morality as such or any moral argument is not to be at any, have any place in the public realm or even in any place in the conservative public realm. Heaven forbid, part of what I'm arguing in terms of constitutional restraints and respect for privacy and, and respect for other people's consciences is exactly the morality of a certain mutual respect. What I'm talking about is not simply able to make one, being able to make moral arguments for and against. It is the nature of the moral arguments, which are less moral than really very sectarian from a very particular and narrow religious position, and the extremity of means used to impose those things. That is the distinction. Um, the reason there has been some calming down or some short victory for those of us 
within the conservative tradition that are against this moralism is because that kind of excessive moralism precisely fell over a cliff with the impeachment battle. Um, we're not just in favor, you're not just in favor of making an argument, as I would be, about the immorality of abortion. You're in favor of a constitutional amendment that would wire into the very constitution the very meaning of what it is to be an American, the abolition of all abortion, including rape and incest. Now that is a whole new level of government power. Um, you weren't interested as I was in writing and talking about Clinton's failures and lies and deceptions, and I'm on record as calling for his resignation. What you wanted was the use of the Constitution itself and its impeachment clause to remove him for those reasons. Another complete difference of degree in terms of the use of, the use of moral arguments. What we're talking about is not amoralism and moralism. It's what I would think of moral prudence and moral extremism. Indeed, not moral extremism, but religious extremism. There is a distinction between making moral arguments in a democracy which appeal to law, which appeal to nature, which appeal to common things, and making specifically and entirely religious and sectarian and essentially Protestant arguments to impose them by extreme means on the rest of the population. That's what people reacted to, and that's what, thank God, Americans said no to in this last 18 months. You know, I think it's just, it's just ludicrous. I mean, the notion that Clinton was impeached for, by, for some sectarian reason or because of religious arguments, was I was making these Protestant arguments or Henry Hyde was making these Protestant arguments? And I mean, what, what's that about? On abortion, I've never appealed to any religious text that I know of, and I don't believe anyone who's written in the Weekly Standard, maybe one, I don't think anyone has, on, on, on those articles we've had on the issue has appealed to a religious text. I, I mean, th this that's- This week in the Weekly Standard, you, in, you sort of have a, a piece bizarrely saying that George Bush is okay because he's a born again Christian. That's, that's, just, that, but that's just not true. Go read this week. Fred Barnes went down and interviewed, Fred Barnes used to write for the New Republic, went down and interviewed George Bush and reported an interesting fact about the Republican, uh, the leading Republican presidential candidate, which is that he apparently, it seems, his religious belief is a little more important to him than most reporters uh, have known. I think it's an interesting fact. People can decide whether they like him more or less because of that uh, than uh, as they wish. It was not that. It was a very interesting piece saying, because this man is not just a Christian, but a born-again evangelical Christian, he is therefore more qualified to be leader of the Republican Party. That, the reason Fred Barnes never wrote that when he was in the Republic, that's exactly the kind of article I didn't want him to write, the New Republic, not because it isn't interesting to know this, but because it is of no interest and should be of no interest whatsoever for a mainstream political party to decide someone's eligibility for candidacy based upon their sectarian beliefs. That is how far this religious no. uh, infiltration has got of the Republican Party. Well, your, your utter mischaracterization of, of, of the piece of a serious reporter, Fred Barnes, shows how far your moral indignation is now leading you to simply misstate facts. But well, it is isn't. People but can it, make up their own minds. Well, I agree. Let them make up their own minds. It is also ludicrous, I think, to say that we don't care at all about people's beliefs. And I mean, that affects their actions. You think that we do not care at all about people's moral, about the, the moral beliefs and the grounding of the moral beliefs of people running for the nation's highest office? I think one can make, when and they one themselves should. make them public. Fred Barnes did not go and interrogate George W. Bush about stuff he was trying to keep private. George W. Bush has discussed how he is informed by certain, his actions as a public uh, official have been informed by certain beliefs, and Fred thought that was an interesting thing to report about. Your desire for privacy, if I, let me just finish this sort of brief rebuttal here, your desire for, quote, privacy has now gotten so extreme that it's in fact unmoored from any sort of normal public debate or public discussion. No. This is a fascinating example of how what used to be the new left has now become the new right. You remember the phrase, the personal is political? That was framed by people on the far left who wanted to transform politics from a place of constitutional realm of, of norms in which people were judged in politics on their ability to do the job in office, to represent the public realm. Now, in the oprification of both left and now right, these very deeply personal things, one's sex life, one's religious convictions are now supposed to be qualifications or non-qualifications for office. 
That is the way in which the new conservatives are really the mirror image of the old leftists. And they are both attacking the public-private distinction upon which a conservative politics rests and must always rest. It is of no interest to me. You know, Harold Macmillan, a conservative prime minister, once said, was asked what he thought, how he thought the British people should conduct themselves. He said they should ask their bishops. They should ask their religious teachers. If they want to know what their morality is, let them consult their own consciences, let them consult their families, their religious authorities, let them not consult their presidents and, uh, and people who run for political office. Yeah, I disagree with that comment of Harold Macmillan, and I think much of modern American conservatism is not based on this Tory view that it would be, of course, uh, um, the government is, is so restricted and it's, it is not consistent with the principles of American democracy, I believe, which is based on the Declaration of Independence and the moral claims in the Declaration, unlike the British Tory tradition, uh, to try to so restrict American public life. Um, so we have, a, we have a fundamental difference on that. I am not for going around inquiring into people's private sex lives. I've never done it. I don't I don't approve of doing it. I disapprove of people on both sides who've done it, and, and I don't believe, in fact, that conservatives have done it. It's done all this, all the alleged sexual McCarthyism. Have you read oh. the Star Report? I mean, it is, it is the most grotesque invasion of, pro now look, you will argue, as I, know, as I know you will, and to some extent you are justified in arguing, that because Clinton himself engaged in these horrifying distinctions in what is and what is not sex, that Starr had a um, duty to cover it to some extent. And I agree with you, to some extent. When you read that report, one cannot be aware, as most Americans were, that this man was motivated not simply by those legal concerns, but by a desire to expose somebody mercilessly in the most intimate aspects of their life in ways that we never, ever needed to know. We never needed to know that, for example, there was oral anal contact between Monica Lewinsky. That was a conservative that wrote that down. That is where conservatives have come, to the most prurient invasion of people's private lives, and not just invasion by private citizens or by the muckraking press, but by an independent counsel with the full weight of the law and the threat of imprisonment if you lie to him behind him. You know, the, mo the, the movement that once destroyed the Soviet Union has begun to echo the very kind of tactics in terms of abuse of government power that the Soviet Union used to represent. Look, that's also ludicrous, if I may say. I was always against the Independent Counsel Act. I'm against it now. I think the impeachment would have gone much better if Congress had done its duty, which I urged them to do early in 1998 and not leave it to star. That is one of the real problems with the Independent Counsel Act. It gets turned into a legalistic question of him having to prove that Clinton mis lied about his definition of sexual relations or his claim that he had engaged in sexual relations instead of what it should have been, a serious congressional investigation into whether the president obstructed justice and lied under oath. So I'm glad to have converts to opposing the independent counsel law. I'm not a convert. I was against it from the beginning. Um, and that's why you put on the cover Star when he issued his report as a uh, portrayed him as Mark McGuire with the headline Star's Home Run. You were so appalled no, by I wasn't. his uh, report I that that's what you did. I wasn't appalled by his report. I never said I, never said I was appalled by his report. I think Kenneth Was it Starr relevant in the report for Starr to mention that one of these trysts happened on Easter Sunday? Was it relevant to anybody I, I, under any constitutional? If that is a Soviet style, I, I myself might not have mentioned that, being Jewish. But if that is a Soviet, <laughs> if that is a Soviet style abuse of power, if you think Kenneth Starr is, I mean, your your position is that Kenneth Starr is a greater threat to this nation uh, than Monica Lewinsky. Yes. Than Bill Clinton. Than Bill think Clinton Bill lying under oath and obstructing justice. That's the fundamental difference between us. Look, it is. Our magazine did not, did not, was not particularly anti-Clinton in the first two years. We, we warned conservatives not to be, think that Whitewater would bring him down. We warned conservatives against counting on a scandal mongering to bring him down. We thought that this particular instance, and many other Americans did too, perhaps not a majority, but certainly a large number, that this was too far, this went too far, that this was this kind of blatant lying in public, the lying under oath, the obstructing of justice, was not tolerable in a president of the United States. I stick with that view. Maybe it cost Republican seats last November. I don't care. I don't personally believe it's going to hurt Republicans in November 2000. But even if it does, I think it was the right thing to do. I agree with you. I absolutely agree with you. And I'm sure that you'll can see that I wrote very clearly, perhaps as passionately as anybody in the Weekly Standard, this man is a disgrace to the presidency of the United States, and he should have resigned. However. <laughs> Uh, at the same time, rather like Americans had to do, 
you have to weigh up two things. Is this man's really disgraceful conduct and disgraceful mendacity, which is what I'm really concerned of as a public matter, um, is that more dangerous to the Constitution of the United States than the arming of an independent council with no accountability, no legal constraints, no budgetary constraints to invade dozens and dozens and dozens of people's lives asking the most invasive and personal questions at point of perjury and imprisonment. What is the greater threat to liberty in this country? A morally iniquitous president who has not invaded people's <laughs> liberties, who has not subjected personal citizens to this kind of power and this kind of attack, or an independent council. Now, my view is that the conservative position is yes, we often have bad presidents. Some of them are so bad and such big liars that they really should resign. But we elected him. The Constitution allows that to happen. But we haven't always had independent councils. We haven't always invested them with this kind of power. And we haven't always put behind them sexual harassment laws. Again, the left becomes the right. Personal is political. To destroy the boundaries of private and public upon which a liberal democracy rests. So yes, the American people looked at it, and they decided Starr was the, was, the, was the bigger of the two evils. And the moment they did, interestingly, was that videotape of Clinton being deposed, which the Republicans thought might be their greatest moment. We will put the president being, answer, being asked these questions in front of the American people and show what a person he is. And Americans looked at it, and they saw an inquisitor under pain of punishment and prison and perjury, asking the kind of questions no one in a free society should ever be asked under the law. And they said at that moment, no, Starr is worse than Clinton, and they were right. And they were conservative when they made that decision. Well, um, the moderator clearly doesn't need to ask questions. <laughs> but, but there might be a question or two from the audience. If you have one, please come to one of the microphones Give us your name and, uh, and Social make your... Social security number. No, no, no other invasions of privacy. <laughs> Just a public declaration and keep your question uh, short, short if you can. Those are always the more effective ones. Sir. Uh, my name is Nat Cohan. Uh, I have a question for Mr. Crystal to get back to this issue of morality and politics. Uh, you somewhat sidestep the issue in saying that well, there's really an important need to make moral arguments um, to use morality. But it seems to me the central issue is that, at least from my viewpoint, uh, the, it's not that the Republican Party is invoking morality in making its arguments. It's that it wants to impose its own morality on other people. Uh, there's a key conflict here between your twin pillars of liberty and virtue. And it seems to me that your brand of conservatism, at least in abortion and homosexuality often places your vision of virtue over other people's liberty. I wonder if you can comment on that conflict and on how you see resolving that contradiction or that, that conflict. Look, there's obviously a tension and, and reasonable people will differ on how to, how to resolve that tension and, and any of uh, the, the society as a whole has certainly changed its mind in certain respects. On abortion though, I think if you think the unborn child is an unborn child deserving of protection of the law, then it's not that hard to, to say that Roe v. Wade uh, was wrongly decided in, in deciding that that unborn child deserved no protection at all from the law uh, and that we should go back to the situation we had in this country where it was a matter of state legislation and that would be fine with me, uh, but that most states, in fact, uh, had decided to protect the unborn child. Uh, on homosexual, uh, on homosexual same-sex marriage, if that was the other part of the question, there are public laws for marriage. One has to, the public, the, the legal system, Congress or the states, have to decide who can get married what, married, what the conditions of marriage are and aren't. And so it's not, one side is not saying, I'm imposing my morality on you, and the other side is saying, leave us free to do what we want. Uh, it, that is a matter of public debate. It has to be a matter of public debate. No society in history has left, has not had laws about who can and can't get married. But Bill, your position is not simply that Roe v. Wade should go. That's my position. I, don't, I think Roe v. Wade is terrible constitutional law and should go, and I think it should be debated in the states. Your position 
is that there should be amend an amendment to the Constitution of the United States to make all abortion illegal, including under rape and incest. That is a much bigger well, well, step, first of all, a huge I, I don't, step. My position actually is that Roe should go. That's why I say Roe is central. I don't believe I personally, I don't, can't say the a word The stand has definitely taken that position. And the Republican as an editorial matter? Do you, do but you, I don't. But I wouldn't oppose it. If, look, if it, I will you say this. That's a classic. I won't oppose it. Are you for it or yes. against it? Yes. Okay, I'm for it. Thank and you. Let me tell you. And let me tell. Well, that that was a great, great. You've proved that I'm pro-life. I'm proud no, to be pro-life. <laughs> I'm proud to be. I'm proud to be pro-life. And unlike some people who say, "Well, I'm pro-life," but I, God forbid, we should do anything to save the unborn children. I think we should do something. I think as a matter of federalism and American tradition, it would be better done at the state level, and that is the way it was done, and that is why Roe should be overturned, and it should go back to the state level. That is why I think the overturning of Roe is an important issue for the next presidential election, because the next president will appoint two or three justices. Uh, and if you, if you are pro-choice, you should care a lot about who the next president is. And if you're pro-life, you should care a lot about it. And it might be one of the most important things the next president does is appoint those two or three Supreme Court justices. So for me to say, as a matter of fact and prediction uh, and judgment, that Roe will be central to the election of 2000, I think is a true statement. On this, you keep saying the rape and incest thing as if it's somehow obviously insane to think that unborn children who are conceived through rape and incest shouldn't be protected. I, that is a t it is a no, very no. hard case, but I'm willing to say, yes, as a matter of principle, though clearly the American people aren't there yet, I would be willing to protect those That's children. That's not the issue. The issue is the Constitution. You are claiming, to begin with, that you don't like this mandated constitutionally, which I agree with. And then you claim that you want the states to decide. But that's not your position. Your position is to amend the Constitution. My position is that I would prefer impossible. to have the states do it. But you asked me, well, are you for it, yes or no, if I that were in Congress? That is a huge leap. That is a massive leap to write into the Constitution oh, of the United States the, 14th the Amendment abolition of all, all abortion. It's not that massive a leap. It's not that massive it's a also leap. Possible. The 14th Amendment wrote into the Constitution the abolition of human slavery. You can write things into the federal Constitution. I would prefer to do it at the state level. But if, if, I mean, I think it will happen at the state level, because practically speaking, obviously, it's going to be easier to get a national majority, if one could even get that, to send it back to the states and let federalism work than to actually get a national human life amendment. But if you're asking me as a matter of principle, as a member of Congress, I, I would vote for that amendment. Let's have another question. <laughs> see see whether, whether we can provoke any controversy. <laughs> uh, I might. Uh, I'm Manuel Lopez, a graduate student. There are areas where I think all of you agree. Uh, for example, on hate, cri on hate crimes. So instead of waiting for someone to commit murder, as in the Shepard case, it makes more sense to discipline and scare him when he's still only a schoolyard bully. But I'm actually interested in a more uh, controversial question. To what extent do you observe or admit differences between gays and straights? Or do you think any such observation could only be the result of prejudice. I myself uh, think that gays tend to be more effeminate and vain, and uh, perhaps in extreme cases, uh, and in some extreme cases, uh, sort of like Aristophanes' description of the poet Agathon. So maybe there's uh, some constancy here over 2,500 years. Aristophanes scholars. Yeah, Aristophanes <laughs> scholars. As you know, I take plenty of hits um, from the gay community for being someone who does not like hate crimes laws. I uh, think they're phony attempts to control people's beliefs and ideas. Um, and I think someone who murders someone should be tried for murder, period. They shouldn't be tried for the, the, even the bigoted views that propel them to commit such a murder. Uh, I don't think because I'm a conservative, because I don't believe the government should be involved in figuring out, as Queen Elizabeth I said, windows into men's souls. Um, secondly, I do think, yes, I think you should be able, and we should be able to make generalizations about some groups if one is constructively trying to make criticisms or improvements or arguments about groups in a constructive fashion. If one is making pathetic, derogatory remarks about people, in groups, then I think it's, it, it reflects very poorly on you. I certainly wouldn't want the government to punish you for it, but I certainly think it reflects poorly upon you. And I, I, I bemoan the sort of politically correct view that you can actually talk about these things openly without fear of being, being called a bigot or otherwise. However, <laughs> I do think that saying that gay people should be cured, that they're diseased, 
um, and that the response to fellow citizens is to put them into mental hospitals as the appropriate response to their dignity as human beings is a pretty despicable way of behaving and it is something which, Bill, you've tolerated um, and sat among and, and it's time it stopped. I don't, I don't believe I've tolerated anything despicable. I've, I spoke at one conference which most of the panels of which, well, I didn't go to any of the panels except the one I was on, but the papers of which I later, later read, most of which seemed to me perfectly reasonable arguments, mostly about public policy, and then some by people who had been uh, homosexual, who said that they were grateful that they no longer were, and others who were involved in that process. And I don't, I have no independent way of judging, you know, how many people those represent or what the sort of deep psychological truth there is, and I don't address that at all, and I never have claimed to uh, have any great knowledge or, 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 or ability to address that. Uh, let me say one word about, uh, not quite about hate crimes, but about sexual harassment law, since Andrew mentioned that, and I'm not sure if the questioner did as well. I, I, I'm, uh, I, think, I think, like many people now, that sexual harassment law became overbroad and, and, and in terms of the evidence that was allowed to be uh, discovered by a plaintiff, and that's, of course, why Monica Lewinsky came into the Paula Jones case in the first place. But I, I am not against sexual harassment law. Now, maybe that makes me not a conservative, but I do think one of the achievements of feminism, of which I approve, uh, is the abolition of an old way of life in this country that was, in my view, unjust and that the government was, was right to step in to prevent, of employers ab abusing employees and and to the degree that you know the legal system, as always, overreacts when it gets into these things. But I am not in principle against sexual harassment law. It's not self-evident to me that what Bill Clinton is, is alleged to have done, and I believe did do, vis-a-vis -vis Paula Jones, should be beyond the reach of the law. That the governor should be able to behave that way uh, to uh, employees of their state government. I, I don't think that's self-evident. I agree that in thinking through the rules of evidence and the rules of procedure for sexual harassment cases, uh, as many as with many others. Uh, that's a complicated issue, and I'm not an expert on it, but I, since, since you had mentioned sexual harassment law, I just wanted to, to, to say that. I don't know if we differ on that or not. Yes. My name's Amy Sullivan, and I think one of the problems some people have with uh, conservatives and abortion is that it seems to have become more of a political issue than a moral one for many, but not all, conservatives. I actually worked for um, Tom Daschle on the abortion alternative that he proposed a couple of years ago, and although we had a few nice things written about it by Mr. Crystal, it failed miserably without the support of a single conservative senator. I'm wondering if conservatives can afford politically to do anything that might make this big issue a little less visible. I think the distinction between morality and politics is critical in an issue like this. In fact, if we don't have such a distinction, we're going to have a war. We're going to have exactly the kind of religious war in this country that liberalism and by extension, conservatism was designed to avoid. I'm pro-life. Um, I believe that I could never be a party to any abortion of any kind. Um, I'm a Roman Catholic. Uh, the idea that I don't have a morality is, is just not true. However, I also understand that some people genuinely, in the very core of their conscience, disagree with me and that what we're disagreeing about is about their own bodies, something as profound and as intimate as that, and that they are sincere. They're not simply engaging in uh, easy uh, immorality or moral nihilism. They're sincere. And in modern society, when these kind of differences exist, it seems to me, and they exist on this and on many other issues, it seems to me that the appropriate conservative response is to find a way to live together. And if we believe, as many of us do, that this is wrong, we should use the, the, the private sphere through writing, through talking, through preaching, to persuade people otherwise, but allow the law to allow people of different consciences to live peacefully together. If we don't, if we, if we propel this as an issue of life or death, we're going to have exactly what's happening, which is, which is nutcases going out and murdering people because the extremity of the rhetoric has gotten so great. That is the danger, and I think that it's an essentially conservative position to resist this radical conflation of morality and politics. Yes. My name is Jacqueline Newmeyer, and I'm a sophomore at the college from Washington, D.C. 
Uh, my question is for Mr. Crystal. You said in your opening remarks that you welcome Mr. Sullivan's moral arguments, but that it wouldn't be wise to encourage moral arguments on all political questions. So I was wondering where you draw the line. I, I didn't have any particular line in mind. I was simply making the obvious point that, you know, there are an awful lot of questions in politics and public life that are matters of prudence. You know, should the tax, top tax rate be 39.4% or 37% or 32%? That doesn't strike me. Uh, to be a matter of, of moral, of great moral import. Now, if the tax rate were 98 or 99 percent and people's wealth were being confiscated, then it might rise to the level of a, a moral issue. And, and so I was simply making the common sense point that many, many things we argue about in everyday politics, while they all have some moral implications, is, does the tax code penalize family life or penalize marriage or reward it? How much uh, is human capital taxed as opposed to physical capital, and those are serious issues, but still they don't rise to the level of some more fundamental moral issues that still need, I think, to be resolved through the public sphere, and that means through politics. It doesn't mean that there's not also a private sphere, but I don't think one can uh, so, so clearly restrict uh, moral debate from politics. I don't think moral debate should entirely take over politics uh, either, though. Now, I'll give you another example. I've, we, the Weekly Standard's been very critical of the Clinton administration's foreign policy with regard to China, also the Republican Congress and the Republican Party, uh, Party's foreign policy with regard to China, uh, because it's driven by, almost entirely, in my view, by commercial considerations. Trade comes before everything else, before national security, before human rights. Now, I can think of occasions, as anyone could, where human rights might have to be sacrificed. Uh, putting human rights at the absolute top of your list of foreign policy concerns might have to be uh, a sacrifice for the sake of, of, of absolute strategic necessities and, and, and geopolitical uh, considerations, but I, I would give human rights quite a lot of weight, uh, and I think in this case it's, it's being sacrificed foolishly for no important uh, consideration. So, I mean, there are many times in politics where the, there's not, you know, morality is not all on one side or another, and one has to balance and one has to uh, weigh things. And, and if I can just maybe tie that into the previous question about Senator Daschle's uh, version of the partial birth abortion ban. I did think there that there was an opportunity for the pro-life movement to be a little more flexible in the means it sought to take, the incremental means it sought to take to advance the pro-life cause. I, I, that was a, uh, it was a complicated argument and it had to do with legal analysis of language that different senators were arguing. I'm not sure whether I was right or not, frankly. But I do think in some respects the pro-life movement has been not necessarily too extreme, though there are a few extremists in the movement as in any other, but maybe a little too rigid in terms of its tactics and, and, and has failed to find opportunities to make incremental advances and to persuade, and to persuade our fellow citizens. Yes. Hello, my name's Giles Edwards and I'm a special student here at the Kennedy School. I'm sure you can all tell that. Um, my question is for Mr. Crystal. You said in your speech uh, that the core, the first, the most important thing in the American Constitution is justice. And then you went on to say that the only part of justice you specified was equal rights. And I'm wondering why you as a conservative who presumably uh, support the Constitution and think that's the core of America don't support equal rights for, hom for homosexuals. Yeah, I'm not sure that I, 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 I think I've meant to say that the Declaration obviously embodies uh, the claim and the truth that all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain uh, inalienable rights um, and, and that we are equally endowed with those rights and I believe that is the core principle of the American regime and I believe you know we have progressed towards equal rights uh, in our history often with great difficulty uh, and I'm for equal rights for all individuals I don't I don't know exactly the end of that sentence is among them life liberty and the pursuit of happiness have you ever considered the possibility that you had a right to pursue happiness which did not include the right to marry the person you loved? Ever? Isn't, isn't the right to marry the person you love something that every no. heterosexual has taken for granted, but it is automatically denied um, a proportion of the population, something that's guaranteed to prisoners and the insane, but is denied gay men and women? Isn't that something of searing and profound importance in equal rights in America? It, well, it certainly wasn't thought to be by the people who wrote the Declaration. Well, neither was, neither was equal rights for blacks and whites. That's not true. That's not true. They knew that was an injustice. They knew most of them knew Some that did. was an injustice, and, and they sought to put, put slavery in the course of ultimate extinction, and it's a great thing. That this well, they didn't, they didn't regard it about for women either. 
No, that's not true. They believed all men are created equal. <laughs> <laughs> Just no right to vote. That, well, that's correct. And as a conservative, you should know that rules of voting, for example, people don't have the right to vote till they're 18 or 21. That's changed the record. It's a little different from fundamental equal rights. But I'm in favor of women's suffrage. Let me say that uh, <laughs> on the record, though the gender the gender gap has made me wonder sometimes whether I'm going to be better off going back to the wisdom of the founders. Um, no, but simply, that's simply, you're simply defining, you know, to define an absolute right to marry whoever one wishes is simply to define that as a right, and that's something that needs to be debated. It certainly hasn't, was never thought to be a fundamental right until, you know, 25 years ago or so when people started to argue that it was, and I think it's an important argument to make. It's, I don't happen to agree with it, uh, but it's a legitimate argument to make in, in the public sphere, and it's a profoundly moral argument. It, yes, sir. To what extent do you think the presidency of, of Bill Clinton has aggravated some of the, the ruptures we've discussed tonight within the Republican Party? I cite to what I think of his, his, of his taking of the traditional Republican econo idea of economic liberalism through his continuation of Alan Greenspan as chairman of the Federal Reserve and his appointment of Goldman Sachs investment banker Robert Rubin as, tre as treasurer, who would, in my mind, be very considered sort of a country club Republican in quotation marks. Um, I, that's an old, if anyone would care to comment. Yeah, he has. Um, he's a very conservative president. The brilliance of Clinton was to co-opt the moderate Republicans. Um, and I think many moderate Republicans last time in the election voted for Democrats because they didn't recognize their own party anymore, um, especially in this part of the world in the Northeast, um, and to some extent in the Midwest. Uh, w when Clinton has signed on welfare reform, when he's put the budget into surplus, um, when he's pursuing a reasonable foreign policy and not crazy moralism of the left or the right, um, he's, uh, as he, he once said, the very beginning, according to Bob Woodward, we're Eisenhower Republicans. And they have been Eisenhower Republicans. Um, uh, and. Oddly enough, I mean, Harvey once wrote in the Weekly Standard a very interesting piece after the acquittal about the relationship of virtue to propriety and the importance, even when one is not virtuous, of seeming to be virtuous for public norms. Well, Clinton did his best <laughs> to appear virtuous. He did his best to cover everything up. It was conservatives that wanted to unleash and unveil all the iniquity beneath. Um, so conservatives are not only um, destroying constitutional balance, they're uh, destroying propriety as well. The, um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> my, our, our power, my power <laughs> increases by every, uh, every minute. Um, it's fantastic. I should stay here longer. Um, these, this great conservative effort, I mean, I discovered Clinton's uh, uh, rather uh, creepy behavior by picking up the Washington Post Wednesday morning, January 21st. So this notion that there was this massive conservative movement effort to un un unearth something. You don't uh, think the American Spectator got there first? You don't think that the 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 uh, the no, religious... they didn't actually get there first in this case. And we we actually criticized the American Spectator for their obsession on Clinton's past misdeeds. So I mean. Uh, there wasn't, you know, there wasn't the conservative movement. Henry Hyde wasn't out there investigating, and I wasn't out there investigating. Kenneth Starr was. Maybe it was a foolish investigation. Conservative maybe foundations not. Conservative foundations poured millions into pouring through the man's past. You can't just disown that. They're part I of can the movement. I can disown that. I didn't pour millions into pouring through the man's past, and why do I? I'm not going to defend what other people have done. I, on the other hand, don't think it, his past is entirely irrelevant to his present, but, I mean, there are things that were relevant and things that weren't. In terms of the question about Eisenhower Republicans, I mean, it's, I think Clinton has to some degree governed, uh, especially on sort of fiscal issues, an Eisenhower Republican. The irony is that the American conservative movement uh, was founded precisely out of unhappiness with Eisenhower Republicanism. Literally, that was Bill Buckley. You read the first issue of the National Review, that's what Bill Buckley was rebelling against. And I guess, yes, I'm not an Eisenhower Republican. <laughs> One last question. Hi, my name is Jeff Letalian, and I'm a sophomore in the college. In the past 30 years, there's been a decline in judgmentalism and a turn towards non-judgmentalism, which has led to more liberal attitudes on certain things. And the argument could be made, and I would make it, that this has led to a breakdown in personal responsibility and a culture of blame, especially with criminals who can blame their backgrounds and their childhood as an excuse. So 
How do you think that conservatism should approach the issue of personal responsibility, which is one that has both liberty and virtue aspects to it? Of course, one should be in favor of response. I don't want to be put in this box that I'm somehow not in favor of making any judgments of any moral kind at all. On the contrary, I believe in doing that every day in every way. As a, as a member of my own religious faith, I try and do that myself and judge myself on those, those grounds. But I think we're a little exaggerating how much these social standards have collapsed. There are 1.8 million people in jail in this country right now, the highest number of people incarcerated in this country's history. The notion that we are sliding towards complete nihilism and tolerance is crazy. The last 10 years have seen declines in divorce, declines in the number of abortion, a collapse in teenage pregnancy, a decline in illegitimacy rates. We've seen a massive increase in incarceration and imprisonment. These have been conservative times. The astonishing thing is that the conservative movement looks at these trends and declares that we're entering a moral abyss. They refuse to take yes for an answer. Or take, take the gay movement. What has happened to the gay movement in the last 10 years? Gay people have taken the astonishing step of asking to serve their country, risk their lives at war, and to marry the person they love and live monogamous committed lives. And the conservatives turn around and say, see, you're destroying civilization. <laughs> I mean, what do they want us to do? <laughs> that's, that's, and the reason this has happened is not because they're making sober judgments about what is happening in society and making sober conservative moral arguments. It's because they're driven, driven by a fundamentalist religious zeal which wants to impose their idea of, of a kind of America on the rest of society and the more America becomes conservative, the more it becomes diverse, the more it becomes integrated as a society, the more hostile and angry they will become. And Bill, you've just acquiesced in that kind of frantic orthodoxy. Most of these people are very strong members of a very particular religious sect, and they're certainly not Jews. And they are, and they are engaged, and they are engaged in a very clear attempt to reform the society. And conservatives, of all people, need to resist them. The, um, I mean, look, it's easy to sit up here and attack those people out there who are allegedly are these fanatic sectarian religious types. I, I, I refuse to join in that, and I refuse to quote resist them. If you, I, mean, I obviously differ with some of them, God knows, many of them on many issues. I, I but I won't lump them all together and, and denounce them, uh, which is awfully easy to do sitting here in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Name an it issue is on simply, which you disagree. It is simply, it is simply, well, what, with whom? I mean, this with is not a monotonous. Jerry Falwell. I, I, I have no great liking for Jerry Falwell. I've never that. met the man. I think his stupid I have videotape. never read you, I've never read. <laughs> it was ridiculous. I don't have any, you know, stake in Jerry Falwell. You do, because Jerry Falwell is a critical power broker in the party you're supposed to support. He's, not a, he's a, not a critical power broker. He has almost no, he has even less power than I do. Then why? Uh, <laughs> the, let, let, me, let me just put this, let me just, the opposite is the why is Why is Steve Forbes converting to fundamentalist Christianity if these people have no power in the Republican primary base? Of course they have considerable power in the Republican party base. I'd just like to know one issue upon which you disagree, say, with Pat Robertson. One issue of public policy. I'm sure there are many. I don't, I don't Just know name what, one. I don't think we, he can actually steer those hurricanes away from Virginia Beach. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> the, look, I, I, public, uh, let me, let me. You may not I believe just, that. I want an issue of public policy about with which you disagree with China, the religious right. China. Pat Robertson is a big fan of engagement in China. He was against most favored, he was for most favored nation status for China. I'm against it, if you want. I mean, only, I can't, he doesn't exactly take a huge number of positions that I'm aware of on most public policy issues, but there's, there's one. I'm sure there are many others. But I'm not going to defend myself here by proving to you that I differ from Pat Robertson. I'm going to say the, admit, just put the shoe on the opposite foot. Ultimately, you are willing to be judgmental about many things. The one thing that most galls you, as you said in your article, and I think you quoted it again today, was a statement by David Frum, who, believe me, is not a member of the religious right, and who I believe, incidentally, I don't want to speak for him, but I'm not certain that he's pro-life, and I, I've never discussed the issue with him, uh, and who wrote a rather libertarian book several years ago. David Frum uh, wrote that the 
core, I think Andrew did quote this tonight, right? What's at stake in the Lewinsky scandal is not the right to privacy, but the central dogma of the baby boomers, the belief that sex, so long as it's consensual, ought never to be subject to moral scrutiny at all. That I do honestly believe is your position, and you simply, any of us who tries to subject sex, as with other human actions, to some degree of moral judgment, uh, respecting the right to privacy and respecting the fact that this is a very personal and intimate sphere of life, is immediately labeled a religious fundamentalist. It's just no. not true that this has to be based on religious f fundamentalism. I think adultery is wrong. I think it is wrong because it is a violation of trust between two human beings in a relationship to which they've committed. There, I've made a moral statement Good. about sex. I do think that consensual sex is a pretty basic first rule of what's moral about sex or well, what's not to begin with. However, I'm not in favor of arresting people in their homes if they, can, if they engage, in, engage in behavior well, with which I'm morally discreet. But, you but are. Let's, let's follow up on it. If adultery is wrong, that does affect one's view of divorce law, for example. There, there's going to have to be laws of marriage and divorce. How is one going to treat divorce? Should divorce be no fault, or should the fact that one partner might have been adulterous affect that divorce? I don't even know what I think the right answer is. You'd have to balance a lot of other things, unanticipated effects of structuring certain but divorce laws. But that is a perfectly legitimate topic of public debate. Absolutely. But what's interesting about the divorce issue is, is, the, is the position we've taken. Many religious faiths, my own included, do not recognize divorce in any way. In fact, consider it adultery. In fact, in the Gospels, it's quite clear that divorce is regarded as the equivalent of adultery. Yet, I am not going to launch a religious crusade to abolish divorce in this country. Do you make exactly <laughs> that false judgment? Uh, on that's, on that's divorce, just not true. On divorce, you're prepared to accept something. On abortion, no, you're not. On both, I'm willing to say that they are matters of public policy and public judgment in which one has to balance, obviously, many considerations, and I balance abortion, them as I think is appropriate. For most people, abortion is a matter of even deeper conscience than divorce, and yet you're prepared to violate the live and let live idea of allowing people that space to make their own choices that's just, with abortion but not with divorce. That, that's just demagogic because, in no, fact, if the unborn child deserves protection, it doesn't, what does it mean to say that it's a matter of deep conscience? for most people. It's clearly a matter for women involved, a profound difficult, much more profound difficulty in terms of the regulation of their own actual bodies and indeed their own right to, to conduct and to, and, to, and to have control over their own bodies than simply the right to divorce. It is obviously something that stirs up far greater right. difficulty and far greater strife. Yet you are much less compromising on something like that than you are on divorce. And I think that's a double standard. And I think you're picking and choosing who you want to tolerate and who you're not. You'll tolerate divorcees, you'll tolerate contraception, you, you won't tolerate homosexuals, and you won't tolerate right. people who want to have divorce. That's just uh, not abortion. true. That's just not true. I mean, I, I, first of all, I certainly do tolerate homosexuals. Um, and secondly, I, given the way public opinion is now, obviously overturning Roe v. Wade would require quite a lot of tolerance of abortion. But if one thinks the unborn child is an unborn child deserving of protection of the law, uh, then it is hard to say, yes, that one should tolerate that private decision. If one believes it is a private decision, then it's a private decision, and then one simply uses moral suasion. If that's, you, that's the core of the one debate. One last thing. If you tolerate homosexuals, are you, in favor, are you in favor of repealing the sodomy laws which make it illegal for people in many states of this country to have private consensual relations? Yeah, I would vote to repeal sodomy laws in Excellent. the states in which they exist. Thank you. That's a start. <laughs> it's not a start. It's not a start. Let me just... I mean, that, that is, you know, I mean, it's not a start, and I don't need to be condescended to by give, be, be, being asked questions and then praised for being in favor of repealing laws that are almost never enforced and that exist in only nine states. The country has repealed those laws on the whole. Well, I'm just... Um, I, I, I think we have to stop. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, you came for a debate, and you got one. <laughs>